Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, it's uh, actually this journey in my lab started when I was at uh, Case Western Reserve uh, as a young assistant professor after leaving MIT. And I went to meet Jerry Silver here. Uh, it's great to see him again after all these years. Uh, and I was, I'm an engineer, uh, and I was under the impression that uh, the scar tissue had all these sugars in it that were negatively charged. And I said, I can deal with charge. I had an electrical engineering kind of undergrad background. And I said, I'm just going to neutralize the charges, and I could get regeneration to happen. Uh, so from that naive perspective, you'll see that today I'll talk to you a lot about uh, biochemistry, uh, trying to understand the problem. But um, that's how my journey started. And I just wanted to uh, thank Jerry for getting us started here. Um, so this is a picture from one of Jerry's papers and illustrates uh, the coincidence of CSPG expression and axons uh, stopping. Uh, and, and there's a lot of evidence for this, uh, not just from this. If you look at development, obviously, you can see at the points of decussation, CSPG overexpression occurs and the nerves turn. Um, in vitro, there's lots of papers from Diane Snow, Paul Letourneau, Jerry Silver, uh, suggesting that if you have CSPGs, uh, growth cones become dystrophic. Um, we know after injury, CSPGs are overexpressed. Um, and then we know that digestion of CSPGs helps alleviate some of the inhibition. So there are lots of lines of evidence that point to CSPG as a barrier. And, and this morning's session with my talk and Jerry's uh, basically looks at this a little bit more closely. Um, in my lab in particular, when we talk of CSPGs, as, as, uh, and I noticed that I was going ahead of um, um, Jerry, I thought I'd show this. You have a protein core. And you have these sugars that come off of the protein core. And the sugars, there are two kinds of sugars. I apologize again for the biochemistry lesson here. But essentially, there are two kinds of sugars. And then there are sulfate groups that are on top of these sugars. And the location of the sulfate determines the kind of sugars. And there are many kinds. Uh, they can be single sulfated at the position of 6 or at 4. Um, and then sometimes you can have both 4 and 6. And so those are dual sulfated sugars. Um, and so we got interested in, when we, know, when we read the papers about CS, uh, chondritinase, ABC, and I'll show you some data about chondritinase, it, it really digests the sugars. The protein core is left intact uh, when, when, you, when you do the uh, enzyme digestion. And so the sugars must be doing something. And the question is what? And what role do they play in inhibition? And it might also be that the nature of the sulfation pattern may govern the extent of inhibition that, that, that these CSPGs afford. And as an engineer, you know, we have all sorts of tools, and Alex maybe will allude to this later today or, or tomorrow. Uh, we have all sorts of tools to modulate and manipulate the environment after healing. We have, you know, I, I work with biomaterials, we have nanoparticles, we have fibers, we have gels, uh, and all of that. But the key to success with any of those tools is we have to understand what biology we want to do uh, to intervene. And Absent that, as Bob alluded to earlier, absent knowing precisely what biology we want to do, the tools don't really help us. And so the journey in my lab um, extends to try to understand the biology enough to be able to custom uh, and, and use the tools that we develop in nanocarriers and gels and such. And I'll show you a couple of examples of that. So, Today, what I'll talk to you about is, is, is a list of things. I, I won't read through this. I'll just show you that. After injury, if you look at the sugars that are present in normal brain, and there are some in the normal uh, uninjured CNS and injured CNS, the profile of sugars in terms of their sulfation patterns changes. And the ones that go up are the ones that are particularly inhibitory to growth cones. Okay, um, And I'll show you that. It turns out that if you want to modulate these things, then it's tough to work with sugars because they're what we call post-translationally modified. So the, it's not easy to affect the function of sugars in vivo. Uh, so we actually look at enzymes that are responsible for the sulfation patterns. And I'll tell you a little bit about those enzymes. Uh, I call them as, they're called chondroitin sulfo sulfotransferases. And these are essentially responsible for figuring out where to put these sulfate groups on, on the sugars, which are, in turn, I'll tell you, responsible for the inhibition. And then I'll show you a little bit about some technologies we're developing in the lab that will help us uh, modulate, uh, modulate their function. And I'll, I'll round things off by looking at some of our data on thermally stabilizing the enzyme chondritinase ABC. And I'll try to do this on time. <laughs> um, so this is the work of Ryan Gilbert. When he was in my lab, uh, he got his PhD actually from Case. Uh, he's now a professor at RPI in uh, New York. And what 
<coughs> what we're showing here is that uh, on the left here is just a gel that runs uh, the, the sulfation, the different gags, just, just the sugars, and the data is here on the right. And if you look at the uninjured cortex versus the injured cortex in the CNS, and we have since done this in the spinal cord and the data holds, the profile of the sugars in terms of the sulfation groups changes. And I'll tell you why this is important in one second. So I showed you earlier where the sulfate groups are. This is 6, this is 0, this is 4, and there are percentages. When there is an injury, you have sugars change. It's not just that the amount of CSPG goes up or down. It is that the nature of the sulfation on the sugars changes. So, and that is the point I wish to make. So we generally, in the, in the field, we tend to stain for CSPGs and say they go up or they go down. And I think the story is more nuanced in the sense that the profile of the sugars changes also after injury. And a new sugar kind of shows up, this 4,6 sulfated sugar shows up. Um, and some of the ratios change as a consequence of that. Well, is there any functional consequence to this? And uh, Ryan did an experiment where we take a gel and put just these sugars now. There's no protein here, again, to show whether the sugars are effective or not. And we can go, in this case, DRGs or cortical neurons. We've grown all sorts of neurons in this. And then see what happens when we immobilize these sugars in these gels. How do the processes react in vitro in a dish? And this is a plot here. And the moral of the story is that normally when there are no sugars in this gel, this is an agarose gel, they grow really well. Whereas when you have this CSE, this dual sulfated sugar, where the four and the six position sugars are sulfated, you have potent, potent inhibition of growing uh, processes. As much as the whole agrican, the whole CSPG, uh, when you take a molar equivalent. So this was a sort of novel finding, and we, did, we published this paper showing that both the length and, and the number of processes uh, is affected just by the presence of this dual sulfated sugar. No protein core, no, no anything. Um, and then we said, well, we want to modulate these sugar expressions. One thought was, well, can we buy, find beads or things like this that just screen the charges somehow and, and be specific? The other thought was, well, there is a power of molecular biology. And we know the enzymes that are responsible for putting these sugars on. And again, I won't go through the whole table. There's a whole family of enzymes that put sugars on specific locations of uh, these are the substrates for these enzymes to act. And they put on these sugars, the 6-sulfated sugar, the 4-sulfated sugar, and then the 6-sulfated sugar that only acts on the 4-sulfated to make the 4-6-sulfated sugar. So once we have these enzymes, now we have a target. We can try to modulate the proteins now, and there's much more developed biology to do that. And so one of the ways to do that is to do um, sort of siRNA techniques where you knock out the RNA with the hope of inhibiting the protein function, with the hope of stopping the sulfation to happen to see if that affects things. Um, so uh, we also wanted to see, do these sulfate, these, the differences that we see, I told you earlier, between normal brain and an injured brain, or immature scar and mature scar, and uh, Dr. Blackmore alluded to that. So we did an experiment, which is a variant of, uh, again, a technique that Jerry Silver pioneered when Bob McEwen won his, in his lab. And Bob is in, at Emory now, and we collaborate. So we put in a nitrocellulose filter in a, sort of at P0 of, uh, of rat pups and took it out at P30. And we said, that scar that we get, so this is our way of pulling out scar as a, to study scar alone and without contamination from other things. Uh, or mature scar, where we put it in later and take out at, at P60, with postnatal day 60, and this would be mature scar. And you can analyze this to look for the ex differential expression of these enzymes that I told you about that are responsible for, for, for the sulfation patterns. And indeed, what do we see? In the mature, immature scar, we don't see that much difference in the expression. The, this is mRNA levels of the 4,6 sulfated CSSTs or the um, uh, four sulfated, whereas in the mature scar you have much more four six sulfated um, enzymes and um, gene expression levels. Again, consistent with the story I told you earlier that in the adult brain you have overexpression of this dual sulfated sugar in response to injury, and that is consistent both in the sugar profiles that you find and the enzymes that are responsible for that sugar profile being generated. So can you downregulate this? And so we, we made some siRNA constructs to do this. And again, I apologize, this is very data heavy. But this is just to show you that you can make constructs in vitro now in a dish that knock down the RNA that is responsible for the different sugars being generated and in, in astrocytes in this case. 
And this is just showing you our ability to knock things down. So um, again, th th these are the different sugar profiles. We, you make a pool of sRNA that targets specifically one enzyme or the other enzyme or both enzymes. And then we, we have constructs that can knock down only the four, six, or both the four and the six and such. So we, we did this experiment, took the conditioned media from astrocytes that are making these CSPGs, and we took conditioned media that, where it was knocked, the sugars were knocked down. So this is a case where now you have a solution from astrocytes where the CSPGs that they're producing are intact, or just parts of the sulfation profiles of the, of the conditioned media are different. So you can now have a set of solutions where you have normal CSPGs that are upregulated or the sugars are deficient in some very specific way uh, by this method. And then you can do an experiment like this where you put lanes and you watch whether things are able to cross into the regions or not from this condition media when the condition media is absorbed onto certain lanes. And what this data is showing you here is that Normally, when you look at, and, and this y, again, I apologize, you can't read it too well, but the y-axis here is telling you the number of crossings, the ability to go over to the inhibitory regions. So normally, if you make astrocytes mad with TGF-beta or something like this, they produce proteins that really stop uh, crossing from happening. And this is when you culture astrocytes with no TGF-beta. And these last two things here are, are when you take conditioned media from astrocytes that where the sugars, two particular sugars were knocked down, either four alone or four, six, and four together. Basically telling you that when everything else is the same, that the astrocytes are making all these proteins, many of which are inhibitory, and you just change the sulfation pattern of what they're producing, then you alleviate inhibition by a lot. Right? So, and again, you know, pointing to the importance of these dual sulfated sugars to, to render the CSPGs inhibitory and, and giving them their quality. Um, why is this important? Uh, it's important because it tells us then that you, you have targets in the spirit of what uh, Dr. Blackmore was suggesting. You, you, you have targets that are very specific and not brute force, if you will, to try to modulate the inhibition of CSPGs. So what do we do now? So now that we know we have targets, my lab does engineering, does materials and things, and one of the things we do is we make liposomes of all different kinds. And now we have a study that we've, we've started in a contusion injury where we are trying to first map the state of the blood spinal cord barrier after injury and what happens in, in, in time course. So the data on this is not entirely clear, and maybe some of you know this better than I do, but there is a window up to six to eight weeks where it is open, but then there is also a suggestion that it remains open chronically for a long period of time. What is the significance of that? So if I have a nanocarrier that I inject intravenously, with contusion injuries, it's very hard to deliver locally, as you know. So if I have a nanocarrier that lasts in circulation for a long time, if there is compromised microvasculature, then this has the ability to extravasate and get to the injury site into the tissue. So we've done this kind of work uh, for lots of different things. For um, brain machine interfaces, we also work in the lab with electrodes in the brain and are very interested in recordings for neuroprosthetics, uh, to, for thought control prosthetic devices and such, but that's a different story. Um, and so we are very interested in in imaging and modulating spaces where microvascular injury has happened between the brain and, 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 and vascular injury. And so we've, we, these are 100 nanometers, really, really small carriers that have a sort of water-loving polyethylene glycol on them that makes them circular for a long time. So when you inject such a thing, if we can play this movie, um, uh, so this, this is, we put a contrast agent in there to, to help you see. Uh, this is in a mouse abdo abdomen. So the tiny blood vessels that you're seeing here are very, very small. The abdominal aorta in a mouse is two millimeters, so very high resolution imaging, that, because we put a contrast agent in there for CT. We can also put drugs in there, and we have done that. And the idea is to inject these nanocarriers into the, into the vasculature, so they localize to regions where the microvasculature is compromised. And we've done this in tumors, where also it is compromised. We've done this in the, around electrode implants, and now we're embarking on this for spinal cord injury. 
and what we wish to do with this is to deliver two kinds of things. One is siRNA to modulate the sulfated patterns that I talked to you about. And the second thing is to look at inflammation and to see if we can use the immune system to help us like Phil Popovich is trying to do. And we've demonstrated in the peripheral nervous system that if we can guide the macrophages towards a so-called so alternately activated pathway, that helps. And we're pursuing studies like that. Uh, and hopefully next year I'll show you some data on this. I'll switch now, if I may, for the last part of my talk to another technology that we are developing for local delivery or to modulate things, and this has to do with chondritinase ABC. And um, many of you are familiar with this enzyme. It's a bacterial enzyme that digests the sugars, and I have told you already that the sugars contribute to inhibition. This just tells you where it digests things, and it does leave a little stub behind that you can stain. Um, and there's lots of data uh, from many, many labs, uh, from James Fawcett's lab to Jerry Silver's lab, showing you very incredible data, and he'll perhaps share some of that data with us tomorrow uh, in his talk. But the issue with chondritinase ABC as it exists today, uh, separate from the variations that Accorda might, uh, might, might generate, is that thermally it's unstable. And as an engineer, so what that means is that if I have scar and that I have to digest over a period of time, soon after injury it takes three, four weeks for it to, to continuously be generated. Or even in the chronic case, if I inject any protein into the nervous system, within six hours it basically diffuses away. So this requires me to use a pump and try to do this. And so, but we have other technologies that we've developed in the lab where with a single injection you can temporarily extend the activity window. The problem with that is that if the protein is not thermally stable, with a single injection it's residing in a 37 degree environment, the, the protein itself denatures and is therefore not effective. So the single injection approaches that can do slow release over a long period of time, reducing the need for catheters and things, do not work when the enzyme is not stable. So we set upon a, a journey to try to fix that. And we settled on this sugar called trehalose. It's an amazing sugar that stabilizes protein activity. It is also found in Arizona and things where things dry out completely and plants seem to wilt away. A little rain falls and the plant comes back to life. And basically, the, those plants are high in the sugar trehalose. And what it does is it protects sugars, it protects proteins from getting denatured um, and, and gives them some resistance. So it's, been a, it's a widely studied sugar. So Hyun Jung Lee in the lab um, decided to work with this. And again, this data is telling you that if you take a model CSPG, in this case it's Dacorin, and run it on a gel, it runs about like that. The enzyme itself runs like this. And, um, and what happens is if you take fresh enzyme and digest this sugar, it, then you, you, you get rid of the CSPGs and the, the sugars, and the protein runs here. And if you, if you store your enzyme for 24 hours, it still seems to work. But if you store it for about a week and with no thermal stabilization, it loses its ability to do this, to get rid of the sugars and run over here. Whereas if you incubate the enzyme with the sugar that I just told you, trehalose, which stabilizes the thing, for one week or four weeks now at 37 degrees, it's, the enzyme still works as it, were, as it were fresh. So what this is doing is that incubation of this TCHABC, which is trehalose stabilized chondritinase ABC, preserves the activity of the enzyme, in this case for four weeks in vitro at 37 degrees, and works as well as it did in, in the beginning, uh, rather than losing its activity when it's not stabilized. And the way it's doing that is this, this is a technique that we use to look at conformation of proteins. And the way a protein denatures is it changes its shape with temperature. And this is just telling you that what happens is that the, it, it, the enzyme that's stabilized also changes shape, but, it, it, the, but we get an eight degree gain. So the temperature at which it changes shape changes by about eight degrees centigrade or so. So you basically make it more thermally stable. You shift this curve when you co-incubate with trehalose. And that's, that's what this data is showing us. So if you take this now, now we have a thermally stable enzyme. We have other tools that we can bring to the table as an engineer. And one of the things we do in the lab is make these tiny straws. These are about 100 microns in length and 0.5 microns in opening. These are lipid straws like you drink coke out of it, exactly. it would take you a long time. Um, and so what you can do is you can load these things up with any protein solution that you want, all right? And the protein only comes out from the end. So you have a long straw filled with a concentrated protein solution, and the protein can only trickle out from the end. And so you get controlled release that you can model and predict the release rate and such. 
So we loaded this, and the advantage of this technique as opposed to other polymeric systems is the protein never sees harsh temperatures, never sees uh, you know, organic solvents and things. This is just loading the straws up, taking dry straws and loading it up. And this is just showing you that when, when the enzyme that is thermostabilized is released from these straws, it remains active for a long period of time than when, when you know, as a, this is a control enzyme that doesn't remain active very long. But essentially this is showing you that you can release the enzyme for a long period of time using these straws. And the idea is that rather than doing repeat injections, you just inject these straws once and then it releases the enzyme over a long period of time and digests the scar for you. And to do that, we did a hemisection injury, just like uh, Dr. Stewart um, um, alluded to, uh, where we engineered a hydrogel that carries these straws, and you can put it in. And we published this. Uh, Angela Jane in the lab did this study. And we did a whole bunch of conditions where we put the enzyme, we put it thermally stabilized, not stabilized, we put penicillinase as a control enzyme so that no, you know, it's not some generic enzyme activity. Um, so we did a whole bunch of controls and, and published the study. I'll give you the reference. Long and short, what the data shows is that when you don't have the thermostabilized enzyme, this is intact CSPG in the region of injury. This is, the, this is a stain, uh, 3B3 stains for the stub that's left behind if your enzyme is active and digests it. Then, so this is a marker of successfully digesting CSPG. This is the stub that we're stain, staining for that is only revealed if the enzyme is successful in digesting CSPG. And these are another markers. These are perineural nets that surround in the area. Uh, and so they're present, they have CSPGs as well. So when you don't use the thermostabilized enzyme, the intact CSPG is present, the stubs are absent, and the perineural nets are intact. And the reason this is important is because one of the actions of digesting CSPGs is you get sprouting, perhaps because of the digestion of the perineural nets. Whereas when you have the thermostabilized enzyme, you digest away the, the CSPGs, the stubs are revealed, and you don't see as many of the perineural nets in the spinal cord, okay? And this you can quantify basically showing you that this is the 3B3, this is the stub, and only in the thermostabilized case do I see that, whereas here this is the intact CSPG, and in the intact CSPG is down in the thermostabilized enzyme case. Uh, now this is a single injection, okay? What's remarkable is that we looked six weeks afterwards to see do the CSPGs come back somehow um, after. And indeed, when you look at the thermostabilized case, we see very little CSPGs coming back. Now, this is a single injection, so at least for six weeks out, we don't see any new CSPGs being deposited or the new CSPGs being deposited are being digested by the single injection that we made early on. Um, and this is the control case. Um, so because you have these straws, you can deliver not only CSPGs uh, or things to digest CSPGs, but you can also help growth and you can deliver trophic factors and other factors there, including DNA or uh, siRNA or other things. And one of the things Anjana did in the lab is she delivered NT3 to stimulate growth. And the idea is now that we can digest the CSPGs away, can we stimulate growth? And, um, and uh, Bradbury did this, but with, 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 uh, with uh, catheters and we did this with our injections. So in the interest of time, I'll just show you we did several measures. Uh, the two measures that we saw the most results on are stride length of rats um, and oh, uh, after time we got an improvement in stride length. And we also saw these 5 HT positive fibers sort of penetrate scar tissue and Anjana did a very detailed analysis to look at which fibers are penetrating scar, how far are they penetrating scar, um, and, and the scar gone away. Um, and it, the, these 5-HT positive you know, fibers seem to be uh, the ones that are growing back the most. And others have shown this as well, uh, maybe to, due to some of the gene expression kinds of change, differences between these fibers and other fibers that Dr. Blackmore alluded to. And we published this uh, a couple of years ago. So I just want to conclude by suggest, suggesting that the gags are particularly important and, and studying their role and understanding their role expands the sort of intervention sites that we have uh, to modulate things and perhaps we could do it less bluntly than I showed you with the entire digestion of the bacterial enzyme and such. If we understand the enzymes and such, we could, we could, they offer more, more targets. Um, and that better understanding helps us design better interventions. Uh, but, and then that there's a critical role for technology that I did not talk about today, 
But the reason I didn't is because the biology needs to be clearer for us before technology is deployed. Um, and there are all sorts of tools that we have from treating, in, our, in my lab we, we study brain tumors, we study brain machine interfaces. So there are all sorts of uh, tools that we can bring to the table in terms of nanocarriers, fibers, gels, uh, imaging techniques uh, to, to study the interface and we can bring all of those to bear once we understand the biology and the underlying, underlying things better. Um, and my hope is, uh, like the question that was asked earlier, is to be able to collaborate with uh, other researchers uh, generating the intervention strategies and deploying uh, the tools that my lab can develop to, to, to move things forward. So with that, I'd be happy to take questions and things. I do want to thank uh, the, I have a wonderful group of people in the lab and collaborators. Some of you will recognize Bob uh, that you know well. Uh, this is a pediatric a neurosurgeon very dedicated to spinal cord injuries in children. Uh, again, we don't talk about this a lot, but he's very, um, and we have some support from Ian's Friends Foundation, which supports that, uh, and some other collaborators. Thank you so much. Thank you.